Graham Stephan just revealed to Dave Ramsey, down to the penny, exactly how much money he has in stocks, real estate, and cash as of right now. This should be really intriguing. I have no clue how I missed this video last week, but we're going to react to this one. I'm going to give you my perspective on this, on uh, you know Graham's uh, $25 million net worth. This is absolutely incredible, okay? Big, big numbers, all right? If you don't know Graham Stephan, by the way, let me know in the comments, first off. If you don't know, you never heard of Graham Stephan. I feel like everybody knows Graham Stephan at this point. If you are on YouTube, like I just don't see how you couldn't know who he is. But if you don't know, let me know in the comment section. But essentially, massive uh, brand in the financial space on YouTube specifically and other social medias as well. But absolutely massive. And, uh, you know, been a, a friend of mine for many, many years, somebody I respect on the highest level possible. And uh, he's built up an incredible net worth over the last decade or so. And uh, some of these numbers, I don't even know the specific numbers. I know roughly what he might have in this and that, uh, but I don't know specific numbers. So this would be a juicy one to kind of get into here and uh, kind of share my perspective on this. I would love to hear your guys' perspective on this as well. Do you feel like he is too much in one asset versus another? What would you do if you had his money? I would love to hear from you guys as always in that comment section. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for being subscribed. Over 10,000 Flippin' Flapjacket subscribers at this point. You gotta be kidding me, man. Absolutely incredible. Thanks for being here. Let's jump into this. And there's my debt. Uh, $4,020,000. Oh, that's juicy right off the bat. Because if you you know Dave Ramsey, from what, my understanding, he hates debt. Like no debt, no debt. Four million dollars in debt, he might lose his mind. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, it's all five mortgages, thirty year fixed, between two point eight seven five and three point six two five percent. I mean, if you're willing to let that kind of money just evaporate, I personally don't do anything. Like that. <laughs> oh boy. So I never thought this would happen, but I was able to sit down with somebody who I've looked up to for almost a decade, Dave Ramsey. Well, you don't know about how... Shut up. Don't <laughs> spend more than you have. He's one of the world's most successful authorities on personal finance with the largest independently owned and operated radio talk show in the country, three New York Times bestsellers, over a billion views on social media, and more than $600 million worth of fully paid off real estate. And today he is... Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Graham was telling me that he owns this, uh, this built like these entire buildings. He owns cash. Like, like there's no debt on that, which is just like hard for me to even wrap my head around because like you see one of those big, massive office buildings in any city, it's usually funded with debt. The fact that you would own that outright is just like hard for me to even wrap my head around the that. fully paid off real estate. And today he is critiquing every single one of my investments. So sit back, hit the like button and subscribe. If you want to see me react to all of his fully paid off investments, I'm watching this on the main channel and I'm not subscribed. Oh my gosh. Okay. I feel like I didn't even realize no, this all the, all these years I've never been subscribed to Graham. Oh my gosh. I feel like at this point I shouldn't do it because if I hit that button, it might jinx something in the algorithm and then maybe like his views go down massively and I get blamed for that. So I'm not going to hit the subscribe. So I know you're going to probably see this Graham. Okay. <laughs> and now with that said, let's begin. So as the personal finance expert, I would love for you to review my portfolio. <laughs> oh, could you imagine if he opened that? And he's like, as the personal finance, financial expert, I would like to give you some advice, Dave. That would have just been hilarious. Oh, God. Give your honest thoughts about each of the properties I own, my stock market portfolio, and how you would improve it or what you think I could do to make it better. And I have everything mapped out on this iPad here for you to start. Mm. Cost $59,500. Renovation was 12000 This is the first property I bought. At the time, I didn't have any credit. I had okay. four years of income saved up, wow. and I bought this one cash. Jeez. I actually went to a what bank. What went wrong after that? <laughs> oh, man. I went to a bank, and no one would give me a loan because I didn't have a credit score. Right. And I thought that was ridiculous because I said I had never needed debt. I paid everything off in cash. Yep. I had a solid income. I had four years of tax returns, and the banks turned me down, which I thought was insane. This is the second the property part that of I am thing. actually right. selling right now. Wow. These properties were all in Ooh. California. Mm -hmm. So nice. because I've left California, I want to begin selling off some of the holdings there. Yeah. What are you going to do with them? Just drop them in 1031s and buy over in Vegas? No, most likely not. I think for the value of these, I don't want to have to be on a time constraint of finding another property. And mm -hmm. I think for the most part, I might just pay the tax on it. I'd roll them into a 1031. Worst case is you bail out of it and pay the taxes. I just did that on a piece of property. I had them some lots associated with a house that I lived in. I sold off those lots and I made a bazillion dollars. 
<laughs> Whoa, bazillion dollars. Holy smoke. Like, okay, wait a minute. So first off, I agree with Dave here. Uh, I think the 1031 would be smart. You know, let, let's say he sells them over the next few months. You know, you got a, a good amount of time to find, you know, some nice properties here in Vegas. The market's going down here in Vegas right now. I think it's going to continue to likely go down for the next at least six months, if not 12 months, in my personal opinion. And if there's the market I know the best around the United States is this market in Vegas. And so I think he could be in a real good situation to inventory skyrocketing right now in Vegas. Uh, prices are coming down. They're going to continue to come down over the next few months. I think he could be in a really good position to have his pick of whatever he wants to have his pick of in terms of uh, you know some good properties, either in Summerlin or Henderson specifically, which are the, definitely the areas I personally prefer. You're not going to have as many problems. Um, that's where people with money want to live in those different communities. Pick up something, you know, maybe at the uh, like a you know 500 to 700 type price range. Uh, that's my personal opinion on that. I think it would be ingenious, and I think uh, you know there's going to be a lot of good deals out there over the next let's call it six to 12 months um, and so i rolled it into a 1031 i'm not sure yet if i'm really going to follow through on it i sure. may end up but i've got that period of time to mess with it yeah which if i don't do that then 100 percent I'm, I'm locking in the tax bill That's this true. is the property that i i think i put 20 or 25 percent down i bought it for 780 mm -hmm. i spent sixty thousand dollars renovating it so i was out of pocket with my down payment 210 wow. 990 equity jeez thousand dollars now it's worth about 1350 so there's about 900 and almost a million dollars of equity 2017 is 585,000 loan of 580. Good story with this one. So I bought this for $585,000. Needed a lot of work. So my initial loan on that was, I think, 480, but I fixed it up. I spent $220,000 fixing it up. And then okay. I got a refinance when it was valued at 900 and something thousand. And that's when I was wow. able to pull out the 580. And this the is what equity I numbers are just absolutely amazing, you know. $300,000 equity here, half a million dollars here, 700,000 here. Ooh, I mean, geez, that's that's a thing of beauty. All the zero dollar home because I was able to live here for free. I pulled out all of my down payment that I put in the property. Oh, got I remember it back. this one. So I was zero dollars yep, in the this property. One. The property cash flowed in between all the write offs I got by using the garage as a studio, the rent from the other side, and living there. It was completely free. Mostly, but you're leaving out opportunity. I was amazed Graham lived in that for so long. You know, uh, to tell you a story about this, you know, oh, gosh, I think I, rem I remember visiting him in. Uh, Either 2019 or 2020, uh, shoot, I think it was 2019, and you know he was still living there, and he was making like really good money. And the fact that he was still living in this little one bedroom place, and he had a um, you know work out of his garage, which by the way, where am I recording this? My garage. Okay, I guess I can't say anything, <laughs> but it was just amazing, like a one bedroom, and he was still just uh, fine being in that one bedroom, even though he was banking money left and right. And so you know, I just uh, that's just amazing because most people, you know, lifestyle inflation, right? Lifestyle inflation, and he was just managed to just completely avoid that, which I thought was incredibly impressive. I mean, you could have put that cash in your pocket if you had a renter in there and you were somewhere else. So. Kind of, because I was able to use that to then buy this duplex, which was mm. uh, a few blocks away. Came up as a really one. good deal. They marketed this incorrectly. So I saw it come up and they marketed it as a one bedroom, one and a half bathroom. But it looked so good in the pictures that I had to see it. So I show up there and I realize that, wait a second, if you just put up one wall, all of a sudden, it's a two-bedroom on each side. Mm. And wow. the price for a two-bedroom would have been significantly more. With that one little change and just calling it a two-bedroom, the rents increased by 50% just because of that one change and the value went up significantly. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> There's a lot of people that do that out there that know their stuff about real estate and they see a little opportunity like that and they're like, this is just a wasted space over here. Or maybe there's one closet's way too big in the house or something like that and, you know, turn into another bedroom and all of a sudden, instantly, it's worth massively more money than if it wasn't. Deal. Then this is the first place that I bought for myself. I went from living in a duplex that was 800 square feet to this, but the cost was 2.1. I put almost a million dollars down on that just so I could have a low payment. But the loan I got was 2.875, 30 year fixed. You know, you should do like a YouTube channel on this. You're <laughs> kind of good at this. I should. <laughs> And then after staying there for a year, I bought this place in Las Vegas. And hey, 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 you're showing part of my house in this video without my permission? I think that's a lawsuit incoming, mister. This is where I live now. So oh, so he's valuing at 2.5. Interesting. Okay. Um, 
We go, that's interesting. That's all I'll say about that. Left half of the house is all studio, and then you know the right half is all the living space. Yeah, cool. this is what I've really been working on for the. He last. literally, by the way, has a Graham uh, Graham Stephens cutout. He's got a Dave Ramsey like uh, cutout guy. It's kind of freaky, man. Two years is uh, diversifying into stocks. The majority of it is eighty percent S and P five hundred. Oh wow! Sit almost seven mil in stocks. And think about that. Think about how much the market's gone down this year too. So. Man, that's a big dang number there. Let's see, uh, individuals. So he's got basically over 5 million index funds. Oh my gosh, okay. I have zero dollars in index funds, by the way. End phase, almost a half million dollars in end phase. Wow. Google McDougal, 230,000. WBA, the good old dividend beast. <laughs> the stock price doesn't do anything, but man, it pays you those sweet dividends. 175,000 there. Tesla, I thought he had sold out of Tesla, but I guess not. He's got $130,000 in Tesla. Apple, he's got $115,000 there. Interesting. Okay. And uh, wow. Interesting. Interesting. So, wow, that's a big number, man. That's a big number. Percent Jeez. international. Congrats. I do have some individual wow. stocks, and those are the five largest holdings. We tell folks not to have more than 1% of your net worth in single stocks because a lot of people get to play in single stocks and lose their butt. The numbers out there on buy, the individual buying and selling single stocks to build wealth is are horrendously bad. They're really bad. I yeah, Dave Ramsey, listen, okay? Graham Stephan might have looked up to you. I didn't, sir, that's disrespectful. How are you gonna say that? No, in all seriousness, <sighs> unfortunately it's true. Um, you know, stocks is, is harder than it looks and uh, there's many various reasons of that, okay? The first part is day trading. So that attracts a ridiculous amount of people and they think, oh man, I can start making 40, 50, 60,000 a year and quit my job and just day trade all the time. And uh, then they find out it's a whole lot harder than it is. Then you got the folks that, uh, you know, just start throwing some money in stocks and think it's gonna work out and then it starts going down, they panic sell. Then you got the people that are gonna to try to get involved in long-term investing and realize it's a lot of work because you gotta actually listen to conference calls. Sometimes your business is gonna be doing better and better. Their revenues are going to be trending right. The margins are going to be trending right. Their net income is going to be trending well. They're attracting more customers, more relevancy. Their brand's getting bigger. And what's a stock do? Down, down, down. You know, if you're in a downtrending market, let's say for instance, right, where the, the S&P or the NASDAQ drops 15%, 20%, 30%, you're in a really, really bad market, <laughs> your stock's going down. I don't care what you own. The baby's going down. And uh, that can be very discouraging for people. And so they end up cashing out and just being you know, like, screw this, man. I, you know, I picked a good stock, it's doing well, and the stock price just keeps going down and down and down. Screw this. Or this company has a great future. You know, and so it's a, it's unfortunate. It is what it is, and it is part of the, uh, I guess you can say, the process. And um, it, I don't know if that will ever magically fix itself because it just, it is what it is. You know, I, I don't think, I don't think there's ever a day when magically we flip those numbers, to be honest. It's just the way, you, and you think about like when people are most attracted to the stock market, think about this for a moment, right? You know, look at how many people want to get involved in the stock market at the end of 2020 and at the beginning of 2021, it was ridiculous. You know, um, how many folks were just coming into the stock market space when everything was pretty much sky high. And then when the stock market drops huge, it's a ghost town. <laughs> And that's just very telling about, you know, the state of things, you know, it, right now I can tell you there's not a lot of retail action out there now, you know, I, I, not even close to what it was back at the beginning of, uh, back at the beginning of 2021, the end of 2020. Oh my gosh. You know, it, it, now it's a, it's a joke. Like Robin Hood lost like, what was this? Over 7 million customers year over year. Like that's just a ridiculous number. 7 million. Like, you gotta be flipping my flapjack. So, you know, there's many various reasons on why that happens. And, um, yeah, I don't, it's never going to fix itself. Unfortunately, there's going to be a certain amount of people that, <clears throat> you know, do it, do it the right way, get through the tough times, consistently DCA, buy the dip, build out a great portfolio of 10, 15, 20 stocks, and they're going to do very well from themselves. But unfortunately, most folks aren't cut out for this game as, as bad as it hurts me. They don't either want to put in the work or they don't have the stomach for it. And they just, um, you know, that just is what it is. Or they get distracted by day trading or options or, or all the other million different things that can distract you, obviously, in the stock market. Swing trading. Oh, gosh. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of distractions out there. Buy any single stocks because I don't track it. I don't want to spend the time on fooling with them. 
I would become obsessed with it. It would drive me nuts. But, you know, you're, you got a small percentage of your total net worth in this. And as long as it doesn't take up a large percentage of your time for that small percentage of your net worth to screw with those singles, then they're they're fine. I don't, I mean, I don't. And I hate the whole perspective, you know, uh, for Dave Ramsey, like, screw, screwing with those stocks. It's just such a negative negative perception that it's just, uh, you know, that, that frustrates me a little bit. These are companies you're buying that have underlying business models. You're not just screwing with stuff and it's like, oh, there's some crazy stuff. You're buying ownership in actual companies, Dave Ramsey. Uh, you're buying actual ownership in, you know, in Graham's case there, Google and Enphase. It's not just screwing around and like, I'm just screwing with these stocks. Um, you know, you can do that. You can, you know, get in and out of stocks and day trade and all those sorts of things. But you know, at the end of the day, if you buy Amazon stock, you're buying the underlying business model of Amazon or NVIDIA or Tesla or whatever stock it is, small, mid, large, it doesn't matter. Um, so it's just kind of something to keep in mind there. They, you know, some of these folks just treat it like, you know, and talk about it in a way that it's just like, uh, it's like, this is an actual company you're buying. You do realize that, right? Opinion about Google or Apple or whatever, because I don't even track them. We got uh, four hundred fifty grand in crypto, and that's been highly volatile. I think. Yeah, at I the, think. <laughs> <laughs> I think at the peak that was about a million. Uh, it's down to about four fifty. It's slightly yeah. below my cost basis now, so I have more invested overall than it's worth. Mm. But your basis really doesn't matter. What matters is the future. Harvard Investment Newsletter did a thing called sunk cost analysis. The class was taught to yell if someone brought up their basis, sunk cost. Sunk costs don't matter. I mean, if you're willing to let that kind of money just evaporate and just disappear, and you can emotionally accept that, and your portfolio can accept that blow, and you want to screw with it, that's fine. I personally don't do anything like that. Good cash. This is actually something that I think is excessive. Whoa! For some reason. Excessive? You gotta be flipping my flapjacks. What? Nearly four million dollars in cash? What? What? Oh my gosh. I don't even know what I would do with that much cash. No, literally, if I ever get up to like a half million cash or whatever, I'm like, I gotta start investing it. I, I gotta do something. Like, I couldn't, I don't think I could ever honestly build up to that much cash. I really don't, because I would just feel like, like even at like a mill, I'd be like, I gotta do something with this money. I gotta buy some stocks or buy a piece of real estate or do something with this. I can't just let this money be in my account. You know, I can hold a few hundred thousand dollars cash, something like that, but four, almost four million dollars? Holy smokers, that ain't no dang jokers. That's his choice. But my gosh, I just, you know, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Because literally, I'd just look at that and I'd be like, is there really nothing in this world that I could put some money in that I think I could generate a pretty nice return, right? Because this is way beyond like feeling of safety, right? Keep, keep, keep a quarter mil around, you know, you'd be just fine, right? Keep a half mil around, heck, keep a million around, okay? And you know, you'd be able to sleep very well at night. Nearly four? Oh my gosh, what would you guys do if you had this much cash? Ay, 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 wow. I've always felt like I feel better just having it the reason you feel like it's excessive is you're a real estate guy real estate people are notorious for not keeping enough cash hmm. they they because we we i'm a real estate guy too we believe in real estate we believe in it we believe in how it works as an investment vehicle and we always have a set of rose colored glasses on how good it's going to be <laughs> the more cash you have the more you lower your risk mm -hmm. and so that liquidity position i i just keep i stack cash you're getting a pinch on one of these properties you know, that's your, that's your safety net. Now, at what point do you begin to realize that maybe you're holding too much cash and it's better to deploy it somewhere? You need, you've got a lot of properties. You need some cash position to protect yourself on those angel <laughs> investments. So these are spread throughout six fintech companies that I've been building up for the last two years. I'm not counting it in my net worth, but if I were to put a value on it today in terms of what someone might offer for it, I just threw that number there. Yeah, that's just... This is, you know, it's icing, it's play money. Sure. It's gravy on the biscuit, so cool. Okay. So this is something that I've actually gotten really into because I, I love cars and watches. Mm -hmm. And my <laughs> philosophy is that if you buy the right car, the right... <laughs> I, I really want to know what Dave Ramsey is thinking about this one, I'll be honest. Like, this is the one I think, oh uh, gosh, that he's probably looking at like... Okay, what are we looking at here, okay? Right, so you should be able to drive and enjoy it for free. <laughs> so these three cars for me, the Ford GT was something that I saw as a great value about a year and a half ago, so I paid 300 for it. And that Ford GT, by the way, has been the best investment that I've made over the last probably year and a half, two years. A Tesla Roadster was the other one. 
Yeah, I think your watch is worth more than you think it is. And there is my debt, uh, $4,020,000. Uh, it's all... I don't know if he was being facetious there or if he was being serious, but uh, yeah, about the watch thing. Mortgages, 30-year fixed between 2.875 and 3.625%. When I've been walking with uh, people with $10 million net worths and greater, decamillionaires and greater, and uh, spending time with them and studying them, first I started studying millionaires just because I wanted to be one. And then I started studying decamillionaires. Now I'm studying billionaires. The rich people always kind of like enamored me. Like I thought they had some kind of special sauce or something. Or they had something. superpower. Like they had a superpower, yeah. that's it. And there was some kind of secret. <laughs> Why is he on a phone now instead of the iPad? To the rich. And it's always disturbed me a little bit that there aren't any secrets. Um, because <laughs> yeah. I wanted there to be this thing that you, if you went hunting for it, you could find sure. it. You know, it's not there. It's the uh, iced yeah. coffee, by the yeah. way. Yeah, that's the secret. That's it. That's the secret. So, uh, well, there are a ton of secrets. Actually, it's just uh, you know, it takes a while to learn them all, and then once you learn them, right, then you don't feel like it's a secret anymore. But for people that don't know these things, they feel like it's a secret. Whether that's you know, analyzing a stock, analyzing a real estate property, you know, uh, understanding taxes on a high level, things like the. The 1031 exchange he was just mentioning there. Like, all those things are, to most people, they would think it's like a secret, like, society that's, like, controlling this information, right? Because they don't have that information. 90% plus of the population doesn't, right? But once you know it, then you feel like it's not a secret. So I just think that's uh, worth addressing. Right? found with them that kind of set me free to be me was um, that the vast majority of them don't do anything that's super sophisticated. As a matter of fact, it's kind of ridiculously primitive. I mean, your, your portfolio is very sophisticated compared to most people mm. that I run into with a $20 million net worth. You've got a lot of, you, you put a lot of thought to it. I mean, you do this for a living. It's what you do. So you, you, you obviously got some brain power on it. But they find something that they like and that they understand and that they're good at. And they do it a lot. You know, so I'll find a guy that's a farmer and he's just buying farmland. Your giftings are much more in the real estate world than they are in analyzing stocks. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were going to put a portfolio together of your knowledge base, it would be 80% real estate, 20% stocks maybe? Probably. You know, that kind of thing. And so really your portfolio, it's okay if your portfolio is real estate heavy if I'm in your shoes. Mm -hmm. I'm a real estate guy. I grew up, mom and daddy were in the real estate business. I got my license like you did when I was 18 years old. Uh, I sold, on, bought a lot of real estate, went broke in the business, started buying again. I've got, I don't know, uh, probably $600 million worth right now, something like that. Yeah, I think one of the reasons Dave Ramsey probably hates debt is because uh, there's, there's some sort of story that happened with him where he had, you know, was was in real estate big and then kind of went belly up in that situation. And like all things in life, when you go through a very painful situation, um, it tends to kind of stick with you, especially in the financial markets. That's why if you look at like, let's say stocks, for instance, if people lose a bunch of money in stocks, they usually leave the market. And many times they'll leave the market forever because they're kind of scarred by that situation, right? Like, screw this, it's a scam. I lost, you know, 60% of my money or 50% or 40% or it doesn't really matter it's just they lost a bunch of money right and um you know the real estate market would be like that as well and for some people it did get like that right in in the um obviously the 2007 through 2011 crisis in real estate a lot of people lost a whole lot of money and um you know some of those people were scarred from real estate for a long time the other folks got started in that that mess and like a grand, for instance, right? And made a fortune on, on real estate right and so their perspective on real estate is very, very good. Right? They love it. They think it's awesome. And so these are just kind of some things to kind of keep in mind. And I think that's probably why he's so anti-debt because he went through that, that tough time. And when you, like I said, it it's kind of scars you. Or, um, so I love real estate. My portfolio is way out of balance mm -hmm. on real estate. Can I aggressively invest in mutual funds and put a lot of money in them? But my portfolio, once I gave myself permission to be me, is paid for real estate, the company that I own, and mutual funds. I don't own any high risk anything. Sure. Um, and I'm okay with it growing a little slower and not being sexy or fancy and all of that. So that high risk is such a, um, in all due respect to, to Mr. Dave Ramsey here, high risk. Who, who's to say what Dave has there is not high risk, right? Those buildings out in the middle of nowhere, you know, the uh, arena type thing he's building out there. Like, like, who's to say that's not high risk in all due respect, right? Um, think about that for a moment, right? He owns it cash. That's a good, that's a good news. But who's to say, 
you know, let's say that we put a dollar number on that. Let's say it's worth 300 mil. Who's to say it's going to continue to be worth 300 mil? Who's, who's to say it's not going to be worth 200, right? Or 150 or 100. So there's just some, some perspective there. I, I feel like any asset can be seen as risk. I don't care if it's stocks, if it's real estate, if it's crypto, anything, right? Um, at the end of the day, all these things have dropped in price several times in the past. And some significantly, not all real estate always makes money. People do lose money on real estate. And even folks that might own it outright, right? That could become less valuable over time. It depends on many various factors. So um, I just think there's always a level of risk to everything you're doing um, that, in, that is in relation to money at the end of the day. Whoa, whoa. Okay. Parlay into, you know, number one, be you. Uh, and you're really, really gifted in the real estate world unusually gifted so run with it dude you're going to make more money there than you'll ever make in stocks or mutual funds and what are your thoughts of keeping that much cash though and not paying off the mortgages i have never met a wealthy person even if they made some money using leverage which you have done mm -hmm. successfully um that regretted having no debt once they got there so i've met a lot of people that done what did what you did and then they said you know what it served its purpose. I'm paying it off. My net worth is exactly the same on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a switch on the P, right? And you will feel it leave your body. You'll feel your body change. It, it's it's whacked. Could you explain that feeling to me? Because I look at that logically and I think paying off a 2.875% mortgage on, mm -hmm. let's say, a rental property in California that's a write-off against the income, mm -hmm. below inflation, I have such a hard time logically overcoming that. I agree with Graham. 100%. 100%. Even though I have a feeling, uh, maybe mentally it, it might be relieving. So what you've got there is you've got a good set of logic, good set of critical thinking that you're looking at that with. There's nothing wrong with that scenario, except the math that you're using has zero mathematical representation of risk. Paid for property has less risk than a property with any kind of debt. Your magic sauce yeah. is not that. Your magic sauce is your ability to do deals that, that are strikingly awesome that's where 90 percent of your net worth has come from or more mm -hmm. it truly yeah. is an esoteric sure. theoretical discussion and we're still going to be friends if you keep it all <laughs> you know if dave ramsey was to take over your portfolio and run it with the principles that i live my life by and i teach i'd pay off the mortgages as quick as i can you're going to sell a couple of them anyway yep. so i'd roll some of those equities and pay off the others and um and i, I would 1031 and start moving towards some commercial over in there and use your giftings uh, to find some real heavy cash flow commercial. And I, you know, I've got both in my portfolio, but the commercial, oh. the commercial's got better IRRs on it. So with that said, I almost worry a little bit about commercial, man, because everybody so always talking about commercial lately. Commercial, commercial, commercial. You got to buy commercial and. Uh, yeah, oh, man, I don't know. I don't even want to comment on that any further. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this reaction video. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, that, was a, that was a very, very interesting video, in my opinion, there between, uh, you know, Graham and obviously Dave Ramsey. I would love to hear your guys' perspective in that comment section. As always, I appreciate you joining me. Much love and have a great day.